Hey everyone, Mark Nascito here for the Mark Nascito podcast. Hope you're doing good. Thank you for tuning in. Finally, we're back to my music series, a history of music. Today is the first one, first of a multi-part year a series of the year 1967. Excuse me, multi-part series of this year 1967. We're going to start today with January of 1967, and um, so. Let's go back from the beginning when I started researching this. I want to say I started it like late in 2020, or early 2021. I know it was at most um, January 2021 I started doing this. <clears throat> but so I remember recording my my last podcast for 1966, the week of New Year's of 2020. And I remember uh, that's when I had, I had COVID still, it was my second week off from COVID. And I started getting in, I started, I recorded the last episode of 66. And I think I started getting into the research of 67. <clears throat> but anyway, um, my research went on a pretty lengthy pause. My father passed away late in January. So I kind of, I kind of just quit in general. And, didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but around July or so, I kind of like fucking myself. I thought, you know what? I don't want to give up. I'm, I enjoy doing it. I want to keep going. So I went crazy with the research. Then for about a month or so, then late July, another problem happened. My father-in-law passed away. And that caused more havoc for me in the sense of not running into the research anymore. I didn't really quit per se then. I mean, I think I quit more so when my dad passed, but when my father-in-law passed, I uh, I kind of took a, took a brief like break from it. And I'm gonna say around maybe January, February-ish or so, I started getting into it again, the research. And I'm still doing the research, it's still going on, but I'm hoping to get it done and get caught up so I can get to where I need to be at when I do the episodes where I need to, you know, finish, if that makes sense to you. Um, so bear with me on that. I'm doing the research still, but I got a couple episodes lined up and uh, looking good so far. So I'm, I'm ready to get into this. 1967, the summer of love, they called it. A lot of stuff happened that year in music, a lot of great music, a lot of weird music. Uh, a lot of creativity was being used in music even fashion, movies, uh, art, you name it. It was just a period of experimentation. It was, if I was there, if I was around then, I would say it's a wonderful, that was a wonderful time. <laughs> but yeah, so without further ado, let's get started January 1967. I'm ready, so let's get pumped and get psyched. Get ready. So remember, remember the Karate Kid when Mr. Miyagi does this, you know, and he heals like Daniel's like arm or leg, whatever. So yeah, so I'm, I'm let's just like get pumped and rock and rock and roll, baby. Anyway, let's let's get started. January 1967, and the sources I'm using for this episode are Wikipedia, the book Psychedelia, 101 iconic underground rock albums. 1966-1970 by Richard Martin Jack, published in 2017. In the book, 1967, A Complete Rock Music History of the Summer of Love by Harvey Kubernick, published in 2017. And uh, further ado, let's rock and roll. So I start here with a prologue that I wrote, if you're ready for it. So uh, in the words of John Lennon, Picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. No, seriously, really. Okay, let's, seriously. Picture yourself in 1967. It is your very first time listening to, to these songs and albums and wondering what went through the minds of these musicians when they wrote this material. What the fuck were they smoking? <laughs> or tripping on, or high on, whatever, you know. Excuse my language. <clears throat> Picture yourself being in San Francisco 
East Village, New York, during this period, and swinging, swinging London, swinging London, as I called it, excuse me, swinging London, for that matter, as I called it then, living this countercultural lifestyle. If you have the opportunity to live during this time, and it was a good time for you, take a trip down memory lane and enjoy what was to become 1967. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> January. Jazz saxophonist and flutist Charles Lloyd releases a two part 45 Forest Flower. Los Angeles band The Doors released their debut 45 Break On Through the Other Side, backed with End of the Night. New York's 11 Spoonful releases the 45 Darling Be Home Soon, backed with Darling Companion. Dino, Desi, and Billy released the 45, If You're Thinking What I'm Thinking. The trio consists of Dino, Dean, excuse me, Dean Dino Martin Jr., the son of crooner Dean Martin. The no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, Desi Arnaz Jr., the son of Desi Arnaz Sr., and Lucio Ball, and friend Billy Hinch, Hinch? I don't even know how to say that word, so sorry if I'm butchering your name, sir. R&B singer Toussaint McCaw releases the 45, Nothing Takes Place of You. The Vibrance released the 45, Something About You, Baby. The Rain Days released the 45, The Acapulco Gold, backed with In My Mind Lies a, Lives a Forest. Live the Forest. The Five Americans released the 45, Western Union. Western Union. Okay, I can't sing. So anyway, um, sure. Greenwich Village, New York's The Young Bloods released their self-titled debut album. Highlights from the album include Grizzly Bear, Tears Are Falling and their rendition of Get Together. Their version of Get Together is perhaps the most well-known version of the song and became an anthem of the 1960s. R&B singer James Carr releases his debut album, You Got My Mind Messed Up. Carr was not as well-known as artists such as Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin, but the album was one of the top soul music albums of all time. January 4th. The Free Spirits released the album Out of Sight and Sound. The band were known for devising what became known as jazz rock, but containing a high psychedelic sound. Lead guitarist Larry Coyle formed the band. Coyle had an interest in blending the styles of artists such as John Coltrane, Miles Davis, The Beatles, and The Rolling Stones. After forming the Free Spirits in New York in 1966, Corio referred to the band as five tripped out cats from all parts of the world who move into the same block in the same neighborhood. And that was from the book, according, um, that was from the book, Psychedelia, 101 Iconic Underground Rock Albums, 1966-1970 by Richard Morton Jack. And the rest of this is from my book as well. So um, when describing some of the tracks and, and reception, it can be justly called ahead of its time from the Frantic opener, don't look back now, but your head is turned around. And a sitar driven, I'm going to be free to the touching, the girl of the mountain, and the hip groover, early morning, fear. It stands as an intriguing bridge between the mod scene of 1966 and the emergent psychedelic culture, also reflecting the band's experience of LSD. It incorporates more elements of jazz than any other rock record up to that time, as well as various guitar effects, sitar, flute, uh, and the silently psychedelic lyrics. Blue Water Mother even features two completely different sets of words being sung simultaneously. And the review, stereo review, called them five young men with extensive jazz roots who bring love and gusto to rock music. 
and in the process make it expand into a broader areas. Adding, they can't sing, and it's just as well for their lyrics are simply ridiculous, but their musicianship is considerable. Drummer Bobby Moses commented about the band. One could say we were a curious amalgam of strong, willed, uniquely talented, slightly insane, visionary beings on the cutting edge of music, musical exploration and psychedelic experimentation. And this is the album right here cover. This is from the book. I just referenced to uh, see that. Okay. Groovy. Groovy, man. Uh, that's the album. And from the book, Psychedelia 101 Iconic Underground Rock Albums, 1966 to 1970 by Richard Morton Jack. That book can be purchased at your independent, at any bookstore pretty much. Also, any, any independent record stores may have it too. One in Denver, for example, I, I recommend going to. Great vinyl, great CDs, movies, and books as well. This book I got there too. So, um, uh, it's called Twist and Chow. And uh, great store, great store, independently owned in Denver. Even, even where you're from, in, in, in your own independent stores, check it out. All right. Los Angeles band, The Doors, released their self titled debut album on January 4th, which became known as one, one of the greatest debut releases of all time. Highlights from the album include Break On Through to the Other Side. Soul Kitchen, The Crystal Ship, 20th Century Fox, Alabama Song, Whiskey Bar, Light My Fire, Backdoor Man, End of the Night, and the conclusion, the controversial epic, The End, which I talked about in my last podcast of 1966. And uh, this here is the album cover. Uh, I'm sure you all saw it. It's well known. <laughs> Too crazy. The Doors. L.A. based man. Uh, great album. It is controversial, but hey, it's, can you say about the 60s, right? <laughs> um, the Doors were formed uh, by Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek. Uh, singer harmonica player Jim Morrison was a film student at UCLA where he earned a bachelor's in film. There he met fellow film student and keyboardist Ray Manjarek. Ray introduced Jim to the drummer John Dedsmore, and John introduced him to guitarist bassist Robbie Krager. And that was how the Doors were formed. Jim picked the name The Doors from the 1954 book, uh, autobiography, called, uh, hold on a minute here, I'm getting my page turn. <laughs> a little slow here, okay, stuck together here. The Doors of Perception by Audio. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm saying his name. The Doors of Percep. The Doors of Perception. Excuse me. My Audio Huxley. Okay, whatever. I'm gonna. I'm gonna butcher her too much. A book about Huxley's psychedelic experience under the influence of mescaline during May of 1953. Excuse me. According to the book Psychedelia 101. Iconic underground rock albums, 1966, 1970 by Richard Moore and Jack. The album centerpiece, however, is a sinister and compelling epic that concludes proceedings. As producer Paul A. Rothschild put it, when the end was first performed in the studio, we took almost a whole day to set it up because it was a very complex piece to record. When we finally got the tape rolling, it was the most awe-inspiring thing I ever witnessed in the studio. Written by Morrison, who was tripping on LSD the first time they attempted to record it in the darkened studio. It features the spellbinding guitar part from the Krager and culminates in Morrison notoriously stating, Father, I want to kill you. Mother, I want to... The press release from Electro Records caused the album an album of over, overwhelming intensity. A vertebra or the tidal wave of pungent electric sound. The album got glowing reviews. Mojo Navigator stated that this album is certainly the best yet by any West Coast group. Hullabaloo states that the Doors 
other new group by which all other new groups must, for a time at least, be measured. And according to the book, uh, 1967, A Complete Rock Music History of the Summer of Love by Harvey Kubernick, uh, a quote by Ben Anzarek, the keyboardist, said, uh, I knew Jim was a great poet. See, that's why we put the band together in the first place. It was going to be a poetry together with rock and roll. Not like poetry and jazz or like, like it was poetry and jazz from the 50s and jazz or like, wait, I'm lost here. <laughs> or like it was poetry and jazz from the 50s, except we were doing poetry and rock and roll. And our version of rock and roll was whatever you could bring to the table. Robbie, bring your flamenco guitar. Robbie, bring that bottleneck guitar, bring that sitar tuning. John, bring that, bring your marching drums and your snares and your four on the floor. Ray, bring your classical training and your blues training and your jazz training. Jim, bring your Southern Gothic poetry, your author Rembrandt poetry. It all works in rock and roll. Sorry, I had a, I messed up there reading it, but that's a quote from Ray Manzarek, the man's keyboardist. Good old Ray, I love Ray, man. Gotta love Ray. Um, January 9th, Los Angeles, the birds released the 45, so you wanna be a rock and roll star. Also on January 9th, Los Angeles band, the Monkees released their second album, More of the Monkees. Highlights include, I'm not your stepping stone, and the Neo Diamond pin, I'm a believer. January 11th, R&B girl group, The Supremes, released the 45, Love is Here and Now You're Gone. January 13th, British band, The Tremolos, released the 45, Here Comes My Baby. January 14th, according to the book, 1967, A Complete Rock Music History and the Summer of Love by Harvey Kubernick, Harvey Kubernick, The Who's guitarist, and primary songwriter Pete Townsend, a sense of restive watching and waiting in an interview with England's melody maker. When asked about the Beatles sabbatical from the hurly burly of superstardom, Townsend stated, I'm a bit disappointed they're not still making records. If they are, I, then I wish they'd hurry up. They are basically my main source of inspiration, and everybody else's for that matter. In the book, by the way, again, um, 1967, A Complete Rock Music History of the Summer of Love by Harvey Kubernick is another book I, you can get at your independent record stores. And of course, any bookstore, pretty much Amazon will have it. Um, but yeah, uh, again, Denver Twist and Shout is a great independent record store. Now, you can probably find this book out, any, any book for that matter, by any musician, artist, junior, whatever you want, whatever interests you. <laughs> January 14th, what may be considered as the first rock festival or, or for the inspiration for what was to become the first rock festival, the human being took place in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. A source stated that majority of all San Francisco's based bands performed. The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Moby Grape, The Great Society, The Charlatans, Quicksilver Messenger Service, the Steve Miller Blues Band, Big Brother and the Holding Company, and Santana, who at the time was called the Santana Blues Band. A number of acts from Los Angeles performed as well. Wikipedia states that a second human being occurred in July of 1967 in Denver by Chet Helms and famed Colorado promoter Barry Fay. It was a harness energy from the original event in San Francisco and to promote Chet Helms' family dog productions venue called the Family Dog of Denver. Chet Helms was an icon of the San Francisco music scene. According to Wikipedia, one of the things he did was become the first producer of psychedelic light show concerts at the Fillmore West and the Avalon Ballroom and was instrumental in developing bands that had that distinctive San Francisco sound. And this here is, so the guy down here with the beard is Chet Helms. 
and there are, the, the picture on the left there is uh, on the right, excuse me, right? I'm looking at my camera here, <laughs> my video uh, is a picture, is a scene from the human being concert in San Francisco. Um, and the picture here on the left is another picture of the human being in San Francisco. Look at all that smoke. Hmm, what could it be? <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> anyway, continue. January 16th, that peanut butter conspiracy. Ooh, peanut butter conspiracy, I like that. That's pretty peanut butterish. Release the 45. It's a happening thing. January 20th, the British band and Spencer Davis group releases the 45. I'm a man. It was the last we released by the band with lead singer keyboardist Steve Winwood. January 20th. The Rolling Stones released their fifth UK album and seventh US album, Between the Buttons. The album features elements of pop rock, psychedelic rock, baroque pop, and music hall. The album's influences came from Mick Jagger after listening to the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album from 1966. Album highlights include Yesterday's Papers, Backstreet Girl, Connection, She Smiled Sweetly, and Something Happened to Me Yesterday. The American version was slightly different than the UK. Let's Spend a Night Together and Ruby Tuesday were placed on the US version in lieu of Backstreet Girl and Please Go Home. Connection was written about the long hours the band spent at airports and the pressures the band were under by 1967. The song was composed before Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and Brian Jones were arrested for drugs. According to Wikipedia, Wikipedia's take on something happened to me yesterday. Uh, at the time of the song's release, Jagger said, I'll leave it to the individual imagination as to what happened. Matthew Greenwald calls it one of the most accurate songs about LSD. The song ends with a spoken passage. Well, thank you very much. And now I think it's time for us all to go. So from all of us to all of you, not forgetting the boys in the band, and our producer, Reg Thorpe, would like to say, God bless. And if you're out tonight, don't forget, if you're on your bike, wear white. Evening all. Jagger has said plainly, fictitiously, that this passage is something I remember hearing on the BBC as the bombs dropped. However, this sort of homely was typically rendered at the end of an episode of an early police procedural Dixon of Doc Green by P.C. Dixon and Old School Bobby. Let me try it again. Let me try it again here, okay? In a British accent, I can. Well, thank you very much, you know. And now I think it's time for us to go and bloody this and I can't do it. I'm not a good, I can't do it. I'm not a good actor. You know, there's a commercial on YouTube in between videos. You want to watch the little, little snippet of a car insurance. I think it's like a picture, it's like a commercial with a, a groundhog or a guinea pig, whatever. And, not a picture, it's just always like a like an animated one, whatever. And the guy's like, Are you tired of those commercials that feature mascots and and the little guinea pigs like, hello, my friends, and the British accent that's cute. Anyway, I had to share that. Sorry. Okay. Wow, two more things to bring up here. January 23rd, RB duo Sam and Dave released a 45 when something is wrong with my baby. January 27th. Scottish singer songwriter Donovan releases the, the American 45 epistle to Dippy. So that's all I have for January of 1967. Um, next week, we're going to talk about more about East Village, New York, which is like New York's version of San Francisco around this period. Um, I found an article about it online. I'm going to read it all to you. And that's next week. So I'll be tuned in for this. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for tuning in. And if you're out tonight, wear white. And if you're on the bike, wear, take a bike, take a hike. I mean, forget it. In the words of Mick Jagger, I'm sorry. And by, by the way, to that, that Rolling Stones um, article I read, the whole thing was from Wikipedia, which I didn't mention at first. I didn't mention a little bit later on in the next paragraph that I want to get it cleared out. It's from Wikipedia in general. This is the, this is the, Make sure I cite my sources there. Um, but yeah, um, 
But again, next week's going to be about East Village, New York, New York's equivalent to San Francisco in 1967. And again, San Francisco was a place where hippies went in this period, listen to music, hang out on the corners of Hayden Ashbury, play bongos, smoke weed, take LSD, who knows, you know, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I, uh, I'll be tuning in next week about East Village. So thank you again for tuning in. Uh, goodbye and God bless.